Thank you so much. That song is taken from the book of Philippians. And Paul is expressing his deep desire. I hope its message resonates with all of us. Uh, I want to say thank you for all those people who have selflessly uh, sacrificed on behalf of other people in the church over the last month. There are people that have gotten COVID while they were giving home remedy treatments and ministering. And I want to praise the Lord also for all the kindnesses, words of encouragement, texts, food, etc., that my family itself experienced as I am on the other side, uh, largely speaking, of my battle with COVID. Uh, I've seen the church pull together. We faced a challenge. And by God's grace, we'll continue uh, learning the love of Jesus by serving through risk-taking as only love can compel people to do. Let's pray. Lord, on this cool but beautiful Sabbath, we come thankful for our freedoms. So thankful that we can turn to you again and again. For your wonderful patience, your providing strength. Now, Lord, I'm praying as the word of God is open that our hearts would be open and that it would be rightly divided. That every individual here will take full opportunity of the privilege they have to make decisions and not be captive to their own sinful human nature. Thank you for the gift of Jesus who makes this worship service possible. And now, Lord, I pray, anoint hearts and ears, lips and tongues. In Jesus' name, amen. I entitled my message this morning, Cowardice and Character at the End. I came across an interesting article in the online edition of Salon. It's written by a Steve Almond. And in the course of his article, he begins by telling about a disturbing situation he went through. He said, a month ago, I was standing outside a movie theater when a fight broke out near me. He said, actually, it was more of a beating than a fight. I heard shouting and I looked up and one man hurled another man to the ground. Uh, the attacker who was wearing boots kicked the victim in the face as if he were punting a football. It was a moment of such savagery that for a moment I froze. The attacker then kicked his victim a, a second time and the man began to bleed. Hey, I shouted, cool it, cool it down. The attacker immediately looked, and looked at me and growled, mind your own business or you'll be next. I had no idea what to do. I didn't want to become a target of the attacker's rage, but I also knew that I should do something. This was all taking place in the middle of a crowded sidewalk where two dozen people were scattered about. Listen to these next lines. Most of them staring at their cell phones devotedly pretending that a vicious assault wasn't happening a few feet away from them on planet Earth. An indifference that was probably aided by the fact that both of these gentlemen shared a common ethnicity. A woman who was somehow mixed up between these two men jumped between the victim, still dazed and bleeding. It was clear he wanted to escape his antagonist. The attacker glowered at his victim and said, remember that. Remember what I just did to you. And then the author of the article said, is someone going to call 911? He said it, really, to no one in particular. I don't think the perpetrator heard me. And then he made some comments about the man on the ground being addicted to drugs. I still wasn't sure what I would do. The author of the article was there holding an event that was going to be hosted at the movie theater. It was about to begin. So I told myself that the violence was, that was really none of my business, and I went back inside. I could have pulled out my cell phone and dialed 911, but I was worried because I thought it might then involve me as a witness with the police. It wasn't until I read Chris Walsh's new book, Cowardice, A Brief History, that I recognized 
precisely why I felt that I behaved like a coward. Which is to fail to protect another human being because I was overwhelmed by fear. I'm afraid that societally we may find ourselves in a very disadvantaged position of being able to identify with Mr. Almond. I'm going to read you a piece, very famous piece. Uh, it was a speech that Teddy Roosevelt made in Paris in 1910, April 23 to be exact, three o'clock in the afternoon. The speech was formally entitled Citizenship in a Republic. I think this is important for you to know because we've come to know it as the man in the arena. But this was not how Roosevelt constructed the speech, which was overwhelmingly received with enthusiasm. In a brief period of time, within a few days, they had printed 5,000 books, sent the speech out to all the teachers in France. It was a surprise to Roosevelt. It starts out, at least I'll start, with the paragraph that reads, the worst way to face life is to face it with a sneer, a cynical habit of thought and speech, a readiness to criticize work with the, where the critic himself never tries to perform, an intellectual aloofness which is not willing to accept contact with life's realities. All of these are marks not of superiority but of weakness. Those of you that have grown up in hardship that are listening to me this morning, you've known poverty. You've had to work with your hands, which is nothing wrong with that. But you've had to work maybe menially just to sustain life. Those of you that have come from communist countries and disadvantaged social environments. For those listening to me this morning who find themselves understanding that they're just dirt you're just another human being, prized, celebrated, redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, the worm that David would speak of in the Psalms. There is no superiority in standing aloof or thinking one superior to the harsh realities of life. Those that have had to face those realities appear to have the moral backbone and the psychological sinew to be able to face off with challenges that are intimidating and maybe fear-inducing. But now let's go on to the paragraph that became so famous. Probably one of the high orders of rhetoric for Roosevelt. He said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. Remember, friends, this was originally entitled Citizenship in a Republic. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, and who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. That speech has been re repeated over and over through the years. Nelson Mandela gave a copy of it to the captain of the South African rugby team. They ended up winning as underdogs against the New Zealand team. The Washington Nationals player Mark DeRosa would read it to himself before big games. And before the Nationals faced the St. Louis Cardinals in game four of the National League Division Series of 2012, De Souza, DeRosa read it aloud to his teammates. That's a quote I've always gone back to, he told the Washington Times. I go to that a lot, I really do. I've done it since college. I like it because people think they know, but they have no idea what we're thinking from pitch to pitch with our backs against the wall. I wanted to say something, 
Now he's talking about to his teammates that brought us together, a little band of brothers. Go out and fight. See what happens. I felt it was fitting. Turns out, historically, the team won. This morning, as I start, I want to remind you, um, I brought into this pulpit a shepherd's staff and a rod. I had an uncle who was a military policeman in Vietnam War. He came back with a billy club. It was about this size, black with a handle. Everyone knew those men were not to be messed with. They didn't go into the bar with guns, but they went in with resolve. Now, in the 23rd Psalm, we're told that God takes good care of us. He leads us where we need to be for food and for water. But I want to remind you something that you may never have heard today, so maybe it's not a reminder, maybe it's introduction of a new thought. The first, six verse, first three verses of the six verses of Psalm 23 about God's provision, the second are about a more deadly intervention and a more dynamic protection. When he talks about his rod and his staff comforting, there can be no doubt that in the dark night of Judean hillsides, that the sense of a shepherd, not only with a staff for bringing people back from the precipice, but with a rod who's whistling through the wind in the hands of a strong-minded and fearless shepherd was indeed and remains still an image of security and comfort to those who might not be as strong as their assailants. And I don't come to you this morning as a cheerleader. I come to you this morning as a coach. And of course, by the way, you've probably noticed the latest coaching news. I was... uh, a little surprised that our Notre Dame football coach could make $100 million coaching people. What I didn't notice in the beginning as I looked over the article was that he has just slightly displaced one of our own Michigan coaches with an almost nine-figure salary. But coaches don't come to make you feel better. Coaches come to help you do better. And when you do what you know you should do, instead of watch people kick people in the head like football, you don't have the regrets that cause you to write the articles about cowardice in America. Now, the phrase that you probably have not heard is one that Shakespeare quoted actually penned, and he said, peace and plenty produce cowards. And I'd like for us to do just a little societal reflecting on what that means over the last two generations if we have ruled the world economically and militarily, as our children's closets have filled up with things that probably don't do them lots of character good, but maybe make us feel better than we felt in the years of our poverty and privation. If peace and plenty promote and produce cowardice, it might be important for us to consider what kind of chosen lifestyles and purposeful decisions of being we are making. I want to uh, assure you that uh, every shepherd who cares for the sheep makes certain that that care is the preeminent director of thought. Now, I want to talk about leadership for just a moment. And in this message, I will address it again at the end. But never in my three decades of pastoring have I put out a survey or licked my finger and stuck it into the wind to figure out what it was that I was supposed to do. That has made me anathema with some and it has made me deep friend and appreciated leader with others. You can survey everything that's not central to your being or your purpose, but you cannot survey the things that shape your identity, your relationship with Christ, or your duty. And it's important for everyone that watches this message, listens to it live, that it be applied according to the Holy Spirit for the sons of light are not to be wiser, or the sons of darkness, that is, of this world, are not to be more shrewd than the sons of light. 
But somehow, in the wisdom of LSU, they're determined that the leadership of one person is worth $100 million over 10 years. And they're willing to pay it. And of course, Michigan's not far behind, which means that every year for the next 10 years, we'll be making a contribution of about a dollar apiece to the sports program. Of course, they get sponsorships, etc. but just breaking it down kind of simple so. The priorities of God's people must be such that we not only laud the soon coming of Christ, but that we prepare for it. I had an administrator ask me recently how I felt about the issue of mandates and vaccination on the other side of having experienced COVID. And I said, I am more against them now than before I was a sick man. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there are a few things in our society that are immoral, and I plan to enunciate them in this message. So let me start with this. It is immoral treacherously hypocritical and categorically unethical to laud medical personnel who took risks that impacted their own lives and that of their family and then rob them of personal medical autonomy and their livelihood and their futures later on. This, my friends, is immoral, hypocritical, and absolutely bereft of integrity. What makes it even more glaringly criminal and indefensible is that anyone who so desires can protect themselves through a variety of mitigations, including three or more vaccinations. I am not against vaccinations, but the idea that we have watched our country over the last nine months slowly go from even the politicians saying that mandating would never happen to the arm of the church encouraging or refusing at least to resist. This is an issue of arrogance, ignorance, and abuse of power. And it might be an issue of impotence based on character. I don't know. Either there are some that are so certain they're right that they couldn't be wrong that they would force their will on the rest of the people. Or they're ignorant of the fact that there are thousands of others well-educated, even including the virologists, scientists, and doctors who have different opinions or else they are just absolutely willing to run over people, or they know there might be another side and they are impotent character-wise because their lives have have been built up in an age of peace and plenty. And so Shakespeare becomes a prophet, not so much a literary agent. This morning, I think it is important that you understand that the gospel of John the Beloved is the gospel of a man so committed to truth and so completely living out a life of love that one controversy after another follows him. And if, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are less mature than those around us to where we cannot have civil discourse of varying perspectives and opinions and thus come out with the benefit of the full spectrum of people's understanding on this, if we are so immature and have so embraced the concept of political correctness that we think we can't talk and disagree, sometimes even strongly, I would like to know which Bible we are reading and which apostle we have decided to follow. For it is absolute biblical history that even Peter and Paul had a public showdown in the church in Antioch. Somehow the church survived. Somehow one was right and one was wrong. Yes, indeed, the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, for some reason, are punctuated, no, not punctuated, built on the superstructure of a loving God who is very willing to let people wrestle through the conundrums, character conundrums, belonging conundrums. I won't take as much time as I did in the first service, And I can make my notes available should you need them. But I'm going to take you very quickly. John chapter 2, Jesus turns over the tables in the temple. He drives them out with a cord. It's a money mess that he messes up. And John chapter 3 is an embarrassing visit with a proud man who doesn't want to be seen with Jesus. Jesus confirms that he's not a saved man. And unless he comes to an understanding through experience, he won't be one. John chapter 4, Jesus is with a woman. 
It's a woman whose past is speckled with dysfunction. He asks her to call her husband, which she will admit she has not won, and she stays in the conversation, but he affirms the fact that she does not have a husband. She then changes the subject matter to worship, and Jesus says point blankly in verse 22 of John 4, you worship what you do not know. The Jews do know what they worship. In John chapter 5, we have a man who's lived by a body of water called the Pool of Bethesda for 38 years. Jesus heals him on the Sabbath day and creates great contention. In John chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 people. They're going to make him king, but he refuses and sends them all away. The next day they find him, and in verse 26 he says, you don't seek me because you really want to hear about what I have to say. You want to know about more loaves and fishes. The congregation grumbles in verse 41. Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And they turn away in droves. And Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of life. In John chapter 7, we have a continuation of a dialogue. The Bible describes the group that's listening to Jesus as doing much grumbling. But in John chapter 7, there is a critical verse which I'd like for you to look at. John chapter 7, verse 17. We go from one challenging situation in the gospel of John to another. And in John 17, which is where our... John chapter 7, that is, where our scripture came from in verses 40 to 43. I want to bring you back to this absolutely elemental component of understanding of self and God's will. John chapter 7, verse 17. If anyone is willing to do his will. So if you're listening to this sermon this morning, you you either came along or you came purposely Understand this one thing, the creator God of the universe, the redeeming savior of Calvary is willing to speak to you, but whether or not you will hear him will be based on whether or not he can be Lord and redeemer in your life. If anyone is willing to do his will, it may put you in opposition to your best friends. It may leave you friendless, but for those that are willing to do his will, they will hear and know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether someone's speaking from their own authority. In this case, it's Jesus. When we look at John 17 and we come to verse 43, we see that the division that was occurring in the crowd was completely because of Jesus. Why would John the Beloved, who leaned on the breast of Jesus... Why would he be so intent in capturing the life of Christ in such a way that we would go from chapter to chapter of challenge after challenge? Finally, at the end of chapter 7, Nicodemus is defending Jesus, and he is skewered by the words of his fellow Sanhedrin. Chapter 8 begins with a woman caught in adultery. Looks pretty bad for her in the beginning. Turns out to be a wonderful transformation, but the chapter is no doubt the pinnacle of difficult dialogue between Jesus and the church. They question who his father is in verse 19. In verse 23 of chapter, he said, and he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I say unto you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They tell him he was born in fornication, in verse 41. He calls them sons of the devil, in verse 44. They say, you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed, in verse 48. And in verse 55, he says he has to tell the truth or else he'd be a liar like them. And in verse 59, they pick up stones to stone him. Now, I'm going to skip chapter 9 because I'm coming back to that. Although I will say this, Jesus drags a blind man into controversy and then disappears. What kind of Savior is that? In chapter 10, we have the famous verse, the shepherding verse about hirelings. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and he scatters them. They picked up stones in chapter 10 to take Jesus' life as well. In chapter 11, we have Lazarus. He actually sets up the crisis that allows Lazarus to die. 
And then when he gets in contact with Lazarus' sister, she rebukes him for not being there. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And she says, yes, I know at the last day. And Jesus says, no, it's not going to happen at the last day. It's going to happen today. When they go to roll away the stone, the same woman says, "Uh, are you sure that's a good idea? Jesus says, roll the stone away. What I want you to see is that Jesus is not afraid of precipitating or causing a crisis in order for the heart to be known and the person to grow. Jesus was one who didn't tell everything he always knew, but didn't hold back from saving people from plunging into self-destruction through fear, avarice, greed, ignorance. When we come to the book of Revelation, we find a challenging situation, also a storyline written out by the hand of John, the the gospel writer. When we come to the last church of Laodicea, it is a rebuke and a challenge. And I do want you to go with me to the last two chapters of the Bible, if you would, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And what I want you to see is that the Bible ends with a gospel warning just as it began with a gospel warning. And for those that are unaccustomed to coaches and are too used to cheerleaders, the challenge of change may be such that you're willing to fritter away your eternal life. But for those that are open to the concept, and I'm especially talking to parents today and leaders of any other type, teachers, ministers, etc., you need to understand that a failure of love is what brings fear. And it is the presence of love that drives it out. Perfect love casts out fear. In Revelation chapter 21, it says in verse 7, He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the contrast is in verse 8. But the cowardly, some of your Bibles say fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars Their part will be with the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So maybe Steve Allman, who's writing his article on the the book on cowardice, maybe Steve Allman and maybe me and maybe you could relate to the idea of doing nothing while somebody's getting their head kicked in. And everybody else is devoutly staring at at their cell phones, so no eye contact can be made. And no sense of compunction or conviction can be laid upon anyone. Yes, indeed, friends, I wish that my humanity was not like Steve Almond's. I wish that I couldn't relate to the fear that accumulates in the shadows of my doubts and worries and insecurities. I wish I could retreat from sometimes the wish of the bullets and the sounds of the ugly words. But the truth of the matter is, No one who is worth anything to anyone else makes choices based on self-interest. They make choices based on love. And that love is sometimes for those that they are not genetically connected to, but the bonds of Christ. The idea that a shepherd would run away at the growl of a wolf or the snarl of a lion is unbefitting to the very presence of a heart of love for those who could not defend themselves. How is it that the cowardly belong with all the other perverted people mentioned there and the wicked, evil, demonic people mentioned in that verse? It's because the elemental dynamic of human experience in the world of sin was fear, and the elemental appearance of Jesus was to drive that fear away with a promise that he would bear the price. He would redeem and he would restore Where we find ourselves now, according to the definitions of Shakespeare, is in an arena where we don't want anybody to create any waves, and the fragility of our connection is such that anybody that suggests that there's a problem here and we need to talk about it is a troublemaker. Ahab was quite up to reframing what God himself had framed through the prophet when after three and a half years, Ahab and Elijah meet each other. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? The framing of a discussion is an important thing, and Ahab was operating with civil and political power. He operated with the ability to intimidate and shape circumstance, but he could not shape the heart of God's man, and he cannot shape even yet through circumstances of apparent colossal 
imbalance of power. He cannot shape the heart of a woman who's not afraid. We find ourselves in the last few verses of the Bible with a warning. I'll start with verse 18, chapter 22. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Well, folks, if you've written those, read those plagues, it's a pretty sober warning here, just four verses from the end of the narrative. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Hardly a cheerleader's end to a difficult 22 chapters. This is one who has paid the ultimate price to redeem us, understands the sophistry, the lying ability, the intellectual superiority of our enemy, and he speaks with clarity and power to making sure our walk with God remains simple, undiluted, and that we rely with a hand in the hand of the great shepherd to make it all the way. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Now, if you would go back to the Gospel of John chapter 9. Brief survey. The beloved who's willing to present Jesus as the not always beloved. John chapter 9, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man born blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Jesus said, It was neither that man who sinned or his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the work of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I'm going to hit the pause button. When I read verse 4 and it says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. The ears of every Seventh-day Adventist ought to prick up. Because we're living in an age in which we saw in a very short period of time a complete turning over of society as we understood it. And what was so disturbing and what was so, what continues to be so unsettling is the inability of many of God's people to be able to articulate that something isn't quite right but to stand on the sidelines while they watch conscientious ones run over by the steamroller of current culture and political power and an absence of of willingness to stand up on on behalf of the various churches, including the Seventh-day Adventist. Verse 6, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and he applied the clay to his eyes. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is transferred sent. So he sent him away and washed, and he came back seeing. The problem was Jesus was gone. And Jesus is gone for this whole story. What kind of Jesus is it that will, on a Sabbath day, create a controversy like this and then disappear and leave a man who's probably already mainly friendless to deal with the animus of the church as they wrestle and dialogue about the healer? Verse 8, therefore the neighbors and those who had previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is this not the one who used to sit and bang? Others were saying, that's him. Still others were saying, no, he's like him. But he kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and he anointed my eyes and he said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and I washed and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. You see, there's an absent Jesus that sometimes is standing in the shadows of the dim unknown, to quote a very famous hymn. And he's actually watching over his own as he lets them stretch his wings, exercise the love that is in their heart, and do some of the difficult things that he would actually be in the way of happening if he was present. So what is your willingness? How do you relate to life? Live and let live. Go along to get along. All I want you to do is make sure my Shakespearean experience is not upset. Leave me with my peace and my plenty. Don't don't test the actual fiber of my character by asking me to take a risk, lay down my job, lose my position, 
Watch my friends speak about me on social media in ways they would never speak to me face to face. Oh yes, we're living in a cowardly age. And yet Jesus understands this man who has suffered all of his life is not without that understanding of what constitutes real love and courage. They brought him to the Pharisees, verse 13, the man who was formerly blind. It was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. He said to them, he applied clay to my eyes. I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man's not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division. Not the first time we've seen those words. So they said to the man who was the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews then did not believe in him. They'd been blind. And that he'd received his sight until they called his parents to the very one who had received his sight. And they questioned him saying, is this your son? Do you say he was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered and said to him, we know that he's our son. And we know that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we don't know. So I need everyone listening to me this morning to ask themselves a question. Would you ever in your fondest dreams believe that you would abandon your adult child at the beginning of the most cataclysmic and awesome new start to life that over your church membership, over fearfulness of losing your social status, you would abandon your child to the ravages of the soccer game where they're punting ideas which are all around him back and forth. I want you to think about it. I've told people nobody starts out getting married planning to divorce. And certainly nobody starts to build a house without being able to finish it. But there is something about self-serving unchallenged. There's something about a crossless Christianity that leads people to places they wouldn't go. And the Bible gives us no commentary on the anguish and the pain that's written in the heart of this man as his parents either declare him to be a liar or able to take the price of standing up to the church. And that's what he chose. Sober, sober storylines. Ask him, verse 20, 21, he's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. And the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him, that is Jesus, to be Christ, he's to be put out of the synagogue. This is some pretty heavy-duty church life. And I just want you to know, friends, it's coming back. For this reason, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time, they called the man who was born blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know this man's a sinner. What a combination of phrases. Give glory to God, and we know this man's a sinner. Well, you know, there's something about this guy, even though all of his life he had been, he had been under the finger of God, even though colossal error persisted in the minds of the culture, somehow he hadn't bought the lie. And I want everybody listening to me to hear that. Somehow he had maintained the idea that he was not what the church said he was and that he was his own person in the economy of God. And you don't arrive at this kind of place in life and all of a sudden summon the courage card and say, I'm going to stand up to my old friends and I'm going to stand independent of my parents and I'm going to face off with the Pharisees. No, no, friends, it doesn't work that way. You reap what you sow and you can't reap a harvest the next day. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that I was blind, and right now I'm looking at you. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? 
I'm telling you, truth is that powerful that the, the guy at the bottom of the pack with confidence in his heart and love in his bosom can say it again and it unsettles them one more time. Nothing runs from light like darkness. Nothing is afraid of truth as error. And it's easier to relegate those who have different points of view to being divisive than it is to actually engage in a dialogue where truth must be discovered. But he's done talking. He answered them, I told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become one of his disciples too, do you? You see, they've given away their hand. If they were card players, they'd be on the losing end because their poker face can't be maintained in the presence of one who is not afraid to speak up, to stand up, and to love. They reviled him and they said, you're his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. I want you to come back to uh, Roosevelt's speech which was entitled Citizenship in a Republic and how he said living with a sneer is the worst way to live. The person whose life is the most impaired in understanding and capacity to love is the one whose life is full of himself. It's the person whose arrogance linked up with insecurity which is how it always works. You never find an arrogant person who's truly a person of confidence. Arrogant people are always exceptionally insecure on the inside because they've never come to grips with who they are to God and who they are to the people around them. And of course, some of the people around have wounded people at times. But there is a healer. His name is Jesus. And he may show up and touch your life and then step out of the picture so that you can wrestle with the next stages of who you are. They reviled him. The man answered and said to them, well, here's an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. We know God doesn't hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. And since the beginning of time, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing, end quote. And they answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and you're teaching us. And they put him out. We've read 34 verses, and Jesus has been gone for most of them. And you know, there are going to be moments when you're going to have to step out of the shadow, let the sun shine on what you really believe and who you really are, let the stiffness in your spine grow, let the dignity of your words always be seasoned with salt, and you're going to have to be the person God's called you to be. If Jesus will do it to an absolute neophyte Christian, what makes you think he's not going to, like, shove you into the arena? We laugh at that old story of all the people standing along the alligator-filled lagoon and the great prize that would be given for swimming across at the hand of the king's daughter. And, of course, all of a sudden there's a flurry and a flash and a splash and someone's in the water and they're crossing at breakneck speed. When the man crawls out the other side unscathed, he only has one question. Who pushed me? There's a divine hand behind our lives. And at times, he's the great nudger. And then he disappears, standing in the shadows of the dim unknown, strengthening, enabling, nerving. This is where we are, friends. We cannot live in a church who decries the ability to disagree as immaturity or divisive. We must live in homes and parishes, and we must be a part of organizations where dialogue is not only civil, even if it is passionate, but it is determined to the discovery of truth. Nothing less will ever do. And no hatred can reside in the bosom of those who dialogue, so they better be praying men and women. But cowardice is a mark of sin from the beginning, and it is the first on the list of the expelled in the end. And only one thing can overcome cowardice, and that is the perfect love of God. 
which casts out fear, ek balo. It's taking fear by the scruff of the neck, and it is ejecting it from your life. You can't do it. There's a reason you feel the way you feel. And all of the therapy in the world isn't going to fix it. But there is something about a growing reality of the one who makes reality by fiat, by voice, by structure of articulation. He takes us on little steps. He leads us in a journey that is doable for us. Jesus heard, verse 35, they had put him out. He's been rejected, categorically rejected. And finding him, he said, in spite of being beat up socially, in spite of being scorned and mocked for his lack of understanding and for his blindless, penalized phase of life, in spite of all of this, and after a few chapters that Jesus himself let him endure, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, pretty special. You can see him, and he's the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. How many people are watching, we don't know, but there are some. And Jesus said, listen to this, friends, for judgment I came into this world, that ho those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. And those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and they said to him, we're not blind too, are we? You can sense that in their heart, they, they don't really reject Jesus, but they're not ready to embrace him. You know, excommunication and all, disfellowship and all. We're not blind too, are we? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. In other words, if you were genuinely ignorant and didn't know better, you wouldn't be held accountable. But since you say, we see, your sin remains. John the Beloved and his wonderful, peaceful gospel, which it is not. This morning, I want you to understand something. There are more and more people who are figuring things out and deciding that probably they should stand up and speak up. And the letter I'm about to read to you is on our website. I encourage you not only to read it, but to disseminate it. This letter comes from a conglomerate of conference leadership prior to the affirmation of their conference committees. That, my friends, is a huge, huge deal. In other words, it's the equivalent of me saying, well, how's everybody feeling out there today? What should I preach on? Well, cheerleader Ron will do it this way this weekend. No, friends, it's a person who can actually stare into the darkness and with insight from the Word of God, anchor themselves like Martin Luther did 500 years ago this April. Yes, indeed, we're at the half millennium mark of that famous speech in April of 1521, where he said, my conscience is bound by the Word of God. Should it be strange that we have such a crisis of conscience 500 years later? Should it be strange that the death of the Protestant Re Reformation should create such a cultural crisis for us? What's happened to our people? Do we not understand that even civic liberty requires some measure of backbone? And yes, everyone's afraid. Nobody wants to be divisive. Nobody wants to lose their job. Pity those poor healthcare workers. And pity all those people in those those agencies and industries of 100 people or more, as we just watch a slow-moving crisis roll over one segment of society at a time. Oh, you call it political. <laughs> call it what you will. But I'm going to tell you this. All of those people made promises there would never be mandates. And beyond that, we're almost two years in living with something that soon we'll call endemic, not just pandemic. And somehow we've managed to make it. 
And there's options for people to decide. And yet, even in the midst of living with it for almost two years, and options for people vary based on your degree of what you'd like disclosed to you before you have something imprinted in you, in spite of this great measure of time and these wonderful interventions that are available, it appears that there seems to be a greater need to make people do what somebody else says is loving to do. I'm here to tell you the world doesn't know how to define the word love. So pity a society that doesn't have a church that can. Yes, this letter was written before they had, you know, <laughs> there's a joke amongst leaders that says, you know, let's see which way the people are going so we can lead them. No, this letter predates, predates that. Although I will say in the few days since it's become public that more than one of the conferences I'm about to mention, their conference committees have come in solidly behind their church officers. Written November 11, the subject is the Southwestern Union's response to the NAD memorandum on OSHA ETS. On behalf and with the approval of the executive officers, that's not executive committee, that's executive officers, of the Arkansas-Louisiana Conference, the Oklahoma Conference, the Texas Conference, the Texaco Conference, the Southwest Region Conference, the Southwestern Adventist University, and the Southwestern Union. We have prepared the following statements, which reflects our convictions, and also we believe those of the Seventh-day Adventist members in the Southwestern Union Territory. In light of prophetic understanding, we formally request that the North American Division, in the light of the General Conference, General um, Council review the OSHA emergency temporary standard and consider the conflicts it presents with the beliefs and practices of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We strongly believe that the mandates as prescribed in the OSHA emergency temporary standard violate the freedom of conscience and the personal choice of our employees and members. Furthermore, it is our belief that the church should not be the enforcer of government policy as we believe in the steadfast adherence to the Seventh-day Adventist Church's principle of separation of church and state. Southwestern Union and its entities request that the North American Division advocate on our behalf in opposing this federal government overreach and violation of church-state separation. The aforementioned entities are prepared to present this issue to their respective executive committees, which some of them have done, for authorization to disregard the OSHA emergency temporary standard collectively. In other words, together. And we ask that the North American Division and the Office of General Counsel to provide counsel, advice, and defense against penalties for such actions. Amen is exactly right. And it's time for this congregation and all those that will watch online to figure out how the web works and go to wherever your conference president, secretary, and treasurer have an email address residing and send them a respectful and prayerful and encouraging challenge that the Lake Union or whatever union you belong to should be the next one to join this common understanding of thousands of Seventh-day Adventists who realize this is extreme overreach and completely irreconcilable with our lauding of those who made the biggest sacrifices in the beginning. It is immoral what we have done. And rather than touting the idea that it's immoral for me to have a free choice or you have a choice, especially in the midst of multiple options on vaccinations, it's time for us to reframe this the way it ought to be understood, which is that God, in the understanding of the elemental cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation, set it up that nobody and no church and no priest and no pastor stands between you and God, only Jesus Christ. This is where this church will reside in the end on whatever issue that is principally brought before it, and, is, and whether it is twisted and portrayed as something other than it genuinely is, how could we expect anything different than what is recorded in Holy Writ? And the dialogue of narratives will go on to the very end until Jesus Christ appears in the clouds. I need you to understand that under the leadership of Albert Moeller, the Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, is suing the United States government. The Baptist Cemetery, Seminary in Houston is doing the same thing. It is not for us to stand by while other evangelical Christians come to the front of the line and listen to the wish of the bullets as they fly by their heads, as they spend their money, as they do their praying, as they seek to respectfully and dignified 
say to a culture that has lost its spiritual moorings, it is time for us to recalibrate, recharacterize, and reassess what this means to us as a people. It is not left to everyone else while we stand there watching somebody's head get bashed in. Yes, the man in the arena. That's you. That's me. If you're a parent, start by standing up to your kids now so that when they're in real trouble and they've got the real undercurrent of wicked culture sucking them into the vortex of eternal self-destruction, it's not the first time they've heard you say, no, you're not doing that, and I don't care what everybody else is doing. This is what I'm talking about right now is the leadership that was in the bosom of the parents who raised you. And if you weren't raised by one of those people, forgive them. And if you want to see what the parenting is like throughout the last six millennia, read the Bible. God is our Father. Jesus came down as our elder brother. And I'm here to tell you today, cowards get put at the top of the list in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, before the perverts and the demon-possessed. And I want you to think about it. Because Shakespeare was right. Peace and plenty have done their dastardly work, especially when churches have failed to enter the fray of giving the loud cry and taking any risk. Yes, the churches have been sinking for years. The church school's leading the way. But this might be the first time we've watched society come so perilously close to be overwhelmed by a different kind of global problem, fear. Jesus walked to the cross by himself. Jesus hung on the cross between two criminals which castigated him for his supposed messiahship. And Jesus never forgot that hanging on that cross was the liberty of an entire universe and the entire human race. And God in his goodness spoke light into the minds of one of those darkened or not so darkened criminals and he said, Lord, Lord. But before he said to Jesus, Lord, he rebuked his partner in crime. And he said, Lord, remember me. And it's as if Jesus said, look at me. How could I forget? Listen, friends, we're headed to a bunch more trouble than we've experienced in the moment. And if we don't know how to walk with the soldiers, I don't know how we're going to run with the horsemen. The troubling of the Jordan is upon us. What are you afraid of? Turn it over to Jesus. But the last thing you want to do is reinforce your fear day by day by failing to be the person the Spirit is prompting you to be. Yes, we're going to see Jesus. And he's not going to say, well done, because of a fantastic job performance. He's going to say, well done, because we followed truth and love the best we understood it. And he picked us up when we fell down. And he shielded us in our vulnerable moments and comforted us in our lonely ones. Yes, friends, now's the time. If you haven't written Jim Mitchiff or Justin Ringstaff or Mike Bernard, go to the website. Get their web address. Write them a wonderfully encouraging, prayerful, and respectful letter. But now's the time to stand up and speak up. Somebody else, a whole, a whole union has put their face into the wind. And it's time for whole churches and whole families to do the same thing. If you're too busy to defend the freedom of the oppressed, if you're willing to stand and watch somebody get their head kicked in, you need more than any human being can give you. But the good news is Jesus will give you what you need. This has been a fantastic church. I stand amazed. 
forward on our knees, forward without fear, and forward with some activity. Don't just sit and lament. Text, call, write, pray, do something. Cleveland Clinic has reversed their mandates, at least for the bean. Advent Health has done the same thing. Can you say amen? Amen. There's a whole lot more that need to stand up and do likewise. May God help us to be the kind of people that it's hard not to listen to. So don't cop a bad attitude and don't pick up the arrogance of the age. You go and do justly and love mercy and walk humbly and you find out over time people do listen even if they don't always like what you say. Be the kind of person that lives just like Jesus and expect a little division. But don't artificially bring it on. May God help us. May we do something. May we trust in the rod because he's the one that's protecting us. And you can protect your job and your home and your future all you think you can for a little while, but eventually it's going to be snatched. And you'll need somebody who can bring food down from heaven and water out of rocks. Let's get a little practice now, friends. Let's get a little practice right now. Amen.